So last week we, we started uh, uh, with these lectures and demonstrations having to do with closing. I explained during that lecture why I start with closing and look backwards. It's the way that you plan out what you're going to do throughout the rest of the trial. I think there's a direct connection uh, and it's more, easily, uh, it's more easy for you to see um, closing argument going back to your witnesses in your case. It's easy to see sort of, um, of course, what I want to say in closing about my own case and about my own witnesses will dictate what I do on direct examination with those witnesses. That's kind of the easy one to see. Uh, and it's also uh, easy to see your own exhibits and what you're going to do with your own exhibits during trial as it may relate to closing argument. Today we go to the sort of, uh, I think, advanced learning topic. That is, I cover closing first, uh, and then second, throughout trial advocacy, I cover cross-examination. And the reason why we go into cross-examination, I, I think it's one that you can learn, and you can also learn the other parts of trial by contrast. That is, I want you to learn a certain way to construct an argument in a cross-examination. I want you to learn how to organize your cross-examination. I want you to learn how to ask the individual questions once you've organized your cross-examination. And then I want to talk about it as it relates to what you get to do when you stand up in closing and how you get to remind instead of argue. Okay, so those are the things we're talking about. I think if you start to learn this technique, and it's just one technique, and it's just the way I teach you, uh, I think it'll, you'll find that it's one of those that'll serve you in most courts, serve you in most fora. But it's one of these deals that uh, it doesn't mean that you won't develop your own style. It doesn't mean that when you get out there in your five years of practice, you can say, you know what I learned that day when I was eating pizza? Uh, I've sort of gone away, I've taken on some of it, and I've gone away from other parts of it. Fine, all right? Learn it this way, think about it this way, I think it'll help you at least in parts of it. It'll help you construct a cross-examination. It'll help you organize a cross-examination. Uh, maybe in some instances it'll help you come up with the individual questions and think about how you're going to ask those questions, which I think is the most important part. And if we're doing it right, it'll relate to our last lecture in a very important way. It'll, if we're doing it right, when you stand up in closing, you're at a different place in the case. Right? A lot of trial lawyers say, oh, I can't wait to get to closing. That's when I'm going to win them over. That's when I'm going to explain all the evidence. That's when I'm going to shock the world. Right? I'm going to get to closing and I'm going to bring it home and I'm going to win the case then. Well, my argument to that, my flip side to that is, no, I hope that when I stand up for closing, I've already been making those connections. I hope when I stand up for closing, I'm doing a bunch of reminding of what happened at trial of ideas that you as jurors have already come up with. I set it out and I set the table and I make it so you, you piece some things together on your own. And then when I stand up for closing, and I organize and I deliver my, my talk at the end, I'm reminding you of the connections that we made throughout trial. Remember when we figured out that that witness wasn't telling the truth? Remember when they offered something on direct, and then my questions on cross-examination, we started to point out, no, actually you said a little something different last time, and then maybe we should call into question everything they said. Maybe we should start to reject uh, their entire testimony and everything they offer at this trial. So I refer back to and I remind in my argument some of those connections. So let's talk about the process of what we're going to do with cross-examination. So I talk about this, uh, you'll find that if you do some reading in books and you look at something famous like Irvin Younger's Ten Commandments of Cross-Examination, it's great, it's brilliant. There's a reason why it's, uh, it's been around for decades and decades. The problem with it is it's a bunch of rules and it's a bunch of one-line rules that don't help you as a law student or a new attorney, don't help you actually construct a cross-examination, right? One of the rules is don't ask one question too many. Well, that's a great rule, but for a law student or for a new attorney who's got the blank piece of paper in front of them or the, uh, you know, the blinking cursor on the monitor, trying to figure out how I'm gonna build this thing up, trying to figure out how I'm gonna construct a cross-examination, uh, it doesn't help you get words to paper. Right? So my principle is, and this lecture is about constructing cross-examination and constructing what I call blocks of questions. The other thing is you have to think of cross-examination, like all parts of trial, and this comes from the last lecture, you have to think of all parts of cross-examination as what do you want to do in closing, where do you want to be at the end of this case. And I think it's making these jury connections. If you're in cross-examination, you're doing it the right way, you're making these little subtle connections with the jury. You're illustrating and you're setting the table for them to arrive at points, for them to come up with what they believe to be their own conclusions, that when you stand up, you're doing nothing more in closing other than reminding them of those connections you made throughout trial. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to learn today. Four topics that we're going to cover today that we're going to go through. The first one is constructing cross. How am I going to start from scratch with a witness? 
And I want you all to appreciate, it's not like, uh, we have a mock trial and a trial advocacy world that we sort of live in throughout law school. And then I know some of you make your way out into externships. You make your way into these great externships as uh, certified lawyers and you actually get a hold of a file and you start to work on matters with your supervising attorney. And the world is great, but you start to get a glimpse into, it's not always that we see, right? We see this witness coming a mile away and we get to prepare it for months. That's not the way it works. Right? I, I can tell you, and I know my, uh, my counterparts in the back are going to hear from Professor Rudberg from the defense side later on, right after me, but on the prosecution table, I can remember a witness going to the stand on numerous occasions where I look at my trial partner and I say, any idea who this person is? Nope. Um, so I'll shoot you for it underneath the table as to who's doing the cross, okay? And you go rock, paper, scissors right there to figure out who's handling this cross this day. It comes down to when you're constructing this cross, still the same principle. Second thing we're going to learn today, is how to organize it. And I talk about organizing your cross into what I call blocks, or sometimes what I would call bullets. That is, I want it to be that you are working on and working towards some goal, some objective, something you want from this witness, and I'm going to talk about what those goals and objectives typically are in a witness ex examination on cross. All right? Organize it into a bullet. It's not the right time to be jumping around from topic to topic and grabbing something from here and there, and then we'll piece it all together in closing. It's not what CROSS is about. CROSS is about a slow, methodical trip through short, clear, and I say yes questions that you can start to illustrate your point and you can start to convey that objective one by one. And then the next advanced learning topic is then you go to connecting that one point you make and having it transition to the next point you want to make. And you draw it out, and you draw it out slowly. And I want my jurors, I want those thought bubbles, those light bulbs to go off above their head to say, I see what he's getting at with this witness. Apparently, this witness has favorable facts for them. I see what he's getting at with this witness. Apparently, this witness wasn't there or didn't see anything. I see what he's getting at with this witness. This witness has said different things on different days, so there's reasons to question their credibility in this case. Right? I want those connections, and I want them organized into blocks where everyone knows it. I want it to be where they get my point, section to section of my cross. All right? If I'm off doing the nutty professor and the unorganized thing, and papers are falling on the ground, and I'm asking one question, and then I'm turning around, and I can't find my notepad, right? if I'm <laughs> lost on cross, guess what? My audience is lost on cross. So I talk about organizing it into blocks or bullets. Next, this should be the easy part. Once you get your objective, and this is the one that comes down to the way we teach it, uh, this is my style, this is the way that I offer it. Uh, one of the reasons I ask uh, other professors like Professor Rutberg to come join us on days like this is because it's very much a style thing. Right? I'm a prosecutor, I ask cross-examination questions probably in a short, more attacking way, more commando way of doing it. Right? I am going after a point, I'm illustrating a point, I'm asking short questions, I want a bunch of yeses. I often talk about my witness on cross-examination is I want to hear yeses like yelping of a dog, right? I want yes, 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 yes. If I can ask my questions in my three blocks of 10 questions apiece and I get 30 yeses, well, guess what? That cross-examination should have gone well. I got to craft those questions. I asked them all short, clear to be a yes. I got all yeses. It should have accomplished what I wanted to do, right? Uh, but that's one style, and I think you're going to hear from Professor Rutberg about other styles that come along with these points, but here's how, the way I'm going to teach it. I'm going to talk about a series of short, clear, yes questions to get at your point and to accomplish the block that you've organized. Lastly, um, it's that making that connection, right? A lot of times you're going to go look at court and you're going to look at someone deliver a cross-examination, and it's as if, again, the jurors are locked away in this zoo exhibit behind a window where they're just watching, right? It's not the way it should be. If we're in a courtroom and I'm performing for you, I'm presenting that day, there's interactions between me and the jury. I'm not joking, I'm not smiling at them, um, but what I'm doing is my body position, uh, how I want them to focus on me, how I want them to absorb certain points, when I pause, when I change my inflection or my volume, those are based on the reactions of my audience. I am doing this for them. Ultimately, when I stand up in closing, I want them to get my point. I want them to side with me. I want them to fill out the form the right way so that they know I was the more persuasive advocate that day and that my case and my theory wins out. Well, if I'm approaching it that way, 
I certainly better be catering to my audience. I certainly better be opening up to and paying attention to how they're reacting to this examination. So I work on the connections during cross, and I'm going to get to show you a little bit about, if you get those connections during cross, how it makes closing different, how it makes closing easier, how you're reminding as opposed to just arguing on first impression. So those are the things we're going to talk about today. So start